Good morning. Hi, everybody. Oh, On I this guess, Tuesday. Yeah, I know. Technically, yeah, it's two yeah. minutes later. It's you know, if somebody went back and watched every Tuesday, we would fall into the same we would trap, wouldn't mess we? mess up 90% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but it is. Happy Tuesday. It's great to be with you. It's it's kind of one of those turning turning kind of fall-like out there, rain. Did you know that we're under a flash flood watch from tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. until Thursday at 7 p.m.? Wow. National Weather Service already wow. issued that. So, yeah, they already do think we're going to get a lot of rain Wednesday and Thursday. Well, we certainly could use it here. Yeah, we yeah. do. It's been a weekend. It's been dry. So, you know, I learned a long time ago here in this part of Texas, you know, you don't really complain about the rain. It's always, you're always needing it. We, we just do. came back from that weekend in Asheville, North Carolina for my son Chris's birthday, surprise birthday party. They got a lot of rain and the trees are just, oh they're like goodness. skyscrapers they out are. there. It's beautiful. One of the very striking, and there's so many trees. Yes. We drove up into the mountains and it's just, yep. just, just, just countless trees, mm -hmm. you, you know, reminds and Remind bugs. I do want to say, when you're by all those trees, <laughs> there's bugs. Yeah. Don't lots like the bugs, do you? Lots of mosquitoes, which really kind of surprised me. And I don't know. For me and me and my son, Robbie, he must have inherited it from me. We both have some kind of pheromone or something that we put out that just attracts mosquitoes. I think Chris tried to convince us those were just gnats. And they were not gnats. <laughs> they were biting gnats if they were gnats. I know Robbie squished one on his arm and it was oh. really nasty. He was like, ah! So, because it was right. definitely a not mosquito. A gnat. Yeah. So, okay. Well, anyway, golly. we're glad you're all here with us today. We really are. And um, I saw Mona was back. I saw you. So we're yeah. really glad you got safely back, back. Safely back. She from watched your yesterday's class from the airplane. Yes. Isn't wow, that something? It's amazing. amazing. And I saw just a few minutes ago um, that the Adams, um, Phyllis and Jim, were closing up their their beautiful little cabin in Colorado, which they have been going back and forth to. But it was like 30 minutes ago. He said, "We're going." There we go. We're going Close home. Let's go and lock it, baby. Because it's getting to be winter time there already. Yep. So it is. It anyway, is. so we're certainly grateful that all of you are with us today, and Scott will be bringing. bringing we're in. The we're in the third Gospel chapter of John. John. Important ch chapter, and like if you ever had a list of important chapters in the Bible, this this one would be up there on the list, and one of the most well known verses in all the Bible. Um, it, we're coming up to today. So anyway, very good. I'll open us up with prayer. What Please do you say, do. Patty? That'd be great. Okay. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are again grateful to be gathered here, to have the opportunity to come together, to study your word, um, to just take an hour and 15 minutes out of our busy days to, um, to sit down and read your word carefully. Every verse, every word. Think about it. Pray about it. Consider it, reflect on it as we strive to, to, to come to know you better, to, to know Jesus better, to know better what it means to be one of his disciples. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okie dokie. Alrighty, I'm move my little chair out of here. I will. The cameraman will reconfigure the camera. Maybe dial back the brightness just a bit. Okay, so we are at John chapter 3. And a couple of things I maybe need to mention. You remember that that traditionally there are, because actually it's just what the gospel says. So really, there were seven traditional signs. Seven signs to who Jesus is that are lifted up as signs in in John's Gospel, because John's Gospel is very consumed with the identity of Jesus, of understanding who Jesus is. Maybe not as much what Jesus does, but who Jesus is, so that we grasp that really everything hinges on, on that. And so we had the first sign, Maybe last week, the week before, the changing the water into wine at Cana. That, that was the first tr sign as to who Jesus is. And then we're told later in chapter 2 
that Jesus had already performed other signs. And, and so the performance of those signs, those miracles, whatever they were, brings a Pharisee to come to see Jesus in the night. And his name is Nicodemus. Um, it's a Greek name, but brought into the Hebrew and, and a, uh, used as a, as a Hebrew name. He is a, evidently, an important person. Um, not only is he a Pharisee, which as I explained last week, was a relatively small group. I mean, maybe 6,000, I guess that's not that small. Uh, 6,000, 10,000 Jewish teachers and so forth in Israel who, who kind of shared a common mind and purpose about um, calling the people back to the law of Moses in the belief that if Israel, the people, really kept the law of Moses in careful detail, then, then God would, the day of the Lord would arrive and God would put all things right and, and off you go. So he comes to see Jesus in the night. I brought a couple of, um, I brought a paint, painting last week and a couple by the same man, Henry Tanner, the, as I said last week, in case you missed it, he is the first, he was the first internationally renowned African-American artist. Studied in Europe, showed his work in Europe, certainly probably more appreciated in Europe. And this is a portion of the painting. I've just kind of enlarged a portion of the painting with Nicodemus, of course, on the left with the long white beard. We don't really know what Nicodemus looked like or how old Nicodemus was, but being respected as he was, yeah, he's probably older, and then Jesus sitting there on on the wall. So we will encounter Nicodemus twice more in the course of Scripture, one where he is defending Jesus in front of his fellow Pharisees, and the last time after Jesus' crucifixion when Nicodemus will assist with Jesus' um, burial. And so he's a significant person. This is such an important chapter um, in, in Scripture. And we will we'll, we'll take our time with this. So we really have a chance to, to, to grasp it because I think it's kind of easily misread and, and you lose a lot of the weight and meaning of it if you don't take your time. So, and when you have questions or things today, just, just pop them into the comment section as always and and, and we'll talk about them. Um, you don't have to worry about how good your typing is. Certainly, you've seen mine on display this morning already. Pretty terrible. <laughs> so, anyway. You just get going too fast. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, all right. So, I see Virginia put up a joy that Dale Cotton, okay, he's at home, he's on oxygen. Well, that's really good because he had COVID and was hospitalized for it. But we're, that, that is a and big Scott, joy. I yes. do want one I missed earlier, and I, I just want people to be aware of this. Rita Gray, who is just, you know, such a faithful Scott Bible study person. Um, really, Rita, I miss seeing you. She is in Houston with her daughter, Andrea, at MD Anderson, and it's time for her daughter's checkup from her cancer. Okay. So please, everybody, keep her in prayer. Yeah. You know, please yep. do. And thank you, Rita, for actually still watching us while you're down there. It's a nervous time. It always is. It oh, I can tell you firsthand, it, it is nervous. And we trust and we believe in Jesus and healing and everything. But, you know, we also know sometimes... Things don't go great, but I know today it's going to go great for Andrea. Indeed. It's going to be Indeed. fabulous. So we're totally with you on that, Rita. I'm praying for you right now. Okay. All right. So we'll just right there in chapter three, right there in verse one, as I'm doing each week, we're working in the NIV, um, the, the 2011 version, not the 1984 one, 2011 version, chapter three, verse one. So, he's, so John writes, now there was a Pharisee a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So he's a member of the Sanhedrin. Um, we think composed of about 70 men 
who basically ruled over the affairs of the Jews, at least with regard to all the typical day-to-day -day things and, and the religious matters and the rest of it. And yes, there was a lot of tension between the priests and the Sanhedrin and um, the Roman governors. So somehow they had to make all of that work as to who was in charge of what. But Nicodemus, like I said, he's an important important person. That's that's a significant part of this story. He's an important person in the eyes of um, the Jews of Jerusalem and Judea and, and Galilee and so forth. So he comes to see Jesus. Now verse 2, he came to Jesus at night. Um, there's two levels to this question, okay? So like why is he coming at night and scholars will offer up all sorts of a day ideas. I think it's as simple as the fact that he isn't anxious to be seen coming to Jesus. So he does come at night. To me, I always like the simplest explanation that explains the most, and for me, that one that works. But there, everybody agrees there's another level to this, because as you go on, then it becomes to clear that, yes, he comes to Jesus at night, because actually Nicodemus is still in the dark. Right? In John's Gospel, there's a lot made of the darkness and the light. That until you embrace Jesus and put your faith in Jesus, you are living in darkness. So this theme, these, this theme of darkness versus light um, is one you always want to keep your eye on in John's Gospel. So I think John, the writer... John the Apostle knows what he's writing here. He came, when he says Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and he said, quote, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Now, we read too much into that. We overinterpret that. This is, he is not admitting much. Is he saying that Jesus is Messiah? No. He's just, he's just calling him Rabbi, Right? Um, uh, and rabbis or teachers who has come from God doesn't mean very much really. It just means, sure, that's what, of course, that's what rabbis come from God. They're, they're coming, you know, sort of bringing, bringing God's teaching to the people and all that sort of thing. So um, we have to be careful about not reading too much into it. Nicodemus doesn't really grasp a lot yet, though he has either himself seen or heard about these signs that Jesus is doing, right? So, so that adds a layer to this. But, but just don't think that this is some big confession on Nicodemus's part and he really understands who Jesus is and all that stuff, because he doesn't. He doesn't, which will become quite clear. So he says, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Okay, so the signs play into this a lot, don't they? There's something different about Jesus. He does these signs. So, so let's just talk about miracle doing for just a minute in the first century. Uh, I think... Um, we don't grasp, we don't really understand that the in, in the ancient world, there were miracle doers. I'll call them that, miracle doers. People who had ways, tricky ways, of doing things that astounded people and could be used for all sorts of purposes. All the way, going all the way back to the story of Moses and Pharaoh. Remember when, when Moses goes and confronts Pharaoh and... He starts doing these things that God has told him to do, the water and the blood and the staff into a snake. For a little while, the magicians can sort of keep up in terms of matching <laughs> Moses' tricks, as it were. But then they fall out of the game. They can't keep up with what God is doing through Moses. Um, or go forward into the book of Acts and you meet Simon the Magician who's doing things and he comes and he wants he wants the power that that Paul is demonstrating you know why to use for his own purposes to 
to wow the crowds and, you know, make a living and so forth. So we have to be careful about um, uh, the miracles. And that's, you know, of, of thinking, well, it's self-evident to everybody exactly what's going on with the miracles and exactly who Jesus is. Certainly not true in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in John, John is careful to always use this word signs so that we we can grasp what's happening, that that these are not the ordinary, unaccounted for tricks by magicians that the people sometimes see. The, no, these are signs. These are signs. And they're of a nature that they tell Nicodemus and some of his buddies, I think that's who the we is in this. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. The we in this is, is Nicodemus and some of his fellow Pharisees, he's there kind of speaking for, that there's something different. He doesn't know what. He doesn't know what. And, and that's why he's come to Jesus in the night. There's something different about this man. I, I think if if some of this, I suspect, is caught up in just Jesus' presence and how he simply is and how he, the, how he sees people and what you see in him and see in his eyes and seeing what he does, it just all makes Nicodemus curious. And I don't think Nicodemus comes from any bad motive. I don't think there's anywhere in this chapter that you could think that he does. I think he, he comes as an honest man seeking to understand something he kind of grasps that he doesn't understand. So Jesus is going to make it clear to him that he doesn't understand what is, what is happening, right? So verse 3, Jesus replies to Nicodemus, very truly I tell you, there's that little formula phrase again, sort of like, truly, truly I tell you, this this is it really, listen up, this is it. I don't even need to tell you this, I'm no obligation, but I'm telling you, this is the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Or, the, 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 the Greek there, anathen, can be translated born again or born from above. And doesn't, you know, um, Nicodemus, what he hears is born again because he's going to take it very literally and it's going to lead him astray. Which sometimes, you know, I don't really use the story this way, but if I wanted to make a point about being careful to read the Bible as God intends it to be read, that there are portions which if you read them literally, you will be you will end up off track. So that's that's what Nicodemus is doing. He's going to hear this phrase, born again, and he's going to get off track with it. Um, Very truly I tell you, Jesus says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So let's talk about the kingdom of God for just a minute. The kingdom of God is the place, the time in which the rule of God is evident to all, manifest to all. Um, we pray for that to envelop all of the earth when we say our Lord's Prayer, when we pray for that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is a synonym, really, for the kingdom of God. Um, and many Jews of Jesus' day look forward to the time when God would raise up a Messiah and usher in this kingdom in which sin and death would be swept away in which the pagans could see the truth of what the Jews had been saying all along, right? Um, and 
the deep and profound prophecies of the prophets, like in Isaiah, about a new heavens and a new earth, and, and in Micah, people sitting under fig trees and pounding their swords into plowshares and their spears and the pruning hooks and all these famous places. Well, they're, they're waiting for that day still. Right? Because clearly when the Romans are in charge of things and they're watching over the temple courtyards, it hasn't happened. So they're waiting for that day. So, so Jesus is, is saying for you to see this kingdom, for you to participate in this kingdom, you must be born again. Or you must be born from above. Um, and of course, born again has become this phrase which certain Christians use to describe themselves and differentiate themselves from other Christians. Like there's, here's the circle of Christians and then there's some circle of born again Christian or something like that. But as I have taught for many years now, <laughs> all Christians have been born again, right? right? Here Jesus is talking about it. Paul talks about it over and over and over again that we are reborn when we come to faith in Christ we are reborn we have been crucified with Christ we have been resurrected with Christ we have been reborn we we are made into new people for this kingdom for this new age as it were and you're going to see in verse 4 well Nicodemus that all just goes right over his head so let's go back to verse 3. Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom unless they are born again. And Nicodemus replies, Well, how can someone be born when they're old? See? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born, you silly, silly man. Right? He's arguing back from a very literal understanding of the words that Jesus utters. And it's clear that Nicodemus just doesn't get it. He has no clue what Jesus is talking about. Honey, in his defense, how many people would know what he was talking ah, about? Ah, well, we're going to see what Jesus' expectation is of, of um, Nicodemus. One theme in the New Testament is that if the Hebrew Scriptures were to be read correctly, men like Nicodemus would understand that Jesus isn't bringing something that had never been thought of, had never been anticipated. That if you understood what the prophets were talking about, you would get what Jesus is doing. You would understand the nature of the kingdom. Um, and, 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 and so when Nicodemus clearly doesn't get it and doesn't understand, it will be used by Jesus to indict him, basically, in a few verses. You know, I think it, um, it helps us to grasp why the Christians kept the Old Testament. There's plenty in the New Testament that doesn't make sense without the Old Testament, and they... There's plenty in the New Testament that says, look, the story which reaches its culmination in Jesus, his crucifixion and his resurrection and the arrival of the kingdom, all of that is tied to what came before in the Old Testament. So you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't dump it. You can't get rid of it. You just have to learn to read it well, anyway, because it's always easy to stack. To, to imagine, I mean, I imagine I would be like Nicodemus, right, in the dark. Aha! There's that. There's that idea again. In the dark, sort of clueless about this. Why? Because we're burdened by sin. It keeps us from seeing things well. So Nicodemus says, "Ah, who can be born when they're old? They can't enter a second time in the mother's womb to be born." And Jesus said, "Again, the formula." Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. That's 
you know, that's 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 Paul's that's in Paul's letters time and again. It is the work of the Spirit who causes those who have faith in Jesus to be reborn, to become these new people. Paul writes in one famous place, it's a verse I actually have memorized. <laughs> If anyone is in Christ, boom, new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Right? That's the idea. And here, Jesus, you know, like generates like. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives birth to Spirit. I often, um, I got this from N.T. Wright. He often says that to what Paul is doing in his ministry is different than many Christians think he's doing. He is actually going around the Mediterranean founding colonies of a new human race. A human race that has not been born of the flesh, but has been born of the spirit. And it's hard for us because we're still walking and talking around in the flesh and people are still getting sick and all this other stuff. But Jesus' own resurrection is the testimony to the truth of what Paul says. Because if you understand the Jewish expectation of the arrival of the kingdom of God, it really began with re resurrection. And Jesus' re resurrection is this flashing billboard to the truth of this, even though it might not look like it to you and to me. Right, so you have to you have to have a a bigger a bigger mind, a larger imagination, willing to go beyond what you can merely see and touch to faith and belief and right um, faith is confidence in the things that you can't see. So flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Jesus says. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Right? Look what he says to Nicodemus. You should not be surprised when I say you must be born again, because Nicodemus was certainly surprised and confused. And <laughs> He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. True? Yep. Yep. Look at today. Here in Dallas. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Well, what do you think that means? The Spirit's work is simply the Spirit's work. And we can't tell where it's coming from or where it's all leading because it is the Spirit's work. It is, look look how accomplished Nicodemus is. He's a very accomplished man. He has to be. He's a Pharisee, a leading a Pharisee, sitting on the Jewish high council, respected by his peers. And there's a whole lifetime of work and effort um, uh, in the Judaism of his day to, to become that. And you would think that all of that would mean that, that sure, he's sure. That's all it takes to be born again. But no, that's not it at all. The spirit, like the wind, <laughs> blows where it, the spirit wants. It's not it's it's not Nicodemus's accomplishments. It 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 will come down to for Jesus, of course, as it does for Paul, putting one's faith and trust in this man, Jesus. He is the point of it all. It begins with Jesus, it ends with Jesus. 
There's no mechanism, there's no program, there's no schooling, there's, there's nothing except for Jesus. Will you trust this man? Will you put your faith in this man? That's the question that runs all the way through John's gospel. And John wants you to grasp who this man is. So you're not putting, why? Because you can put your faith in a Jesus that you've created in your own mind. A lot of the world does that. A lot of Christianity does that in a, you know, in our modern day in America. You end up, you, you search for the God that you want to find, you, that seems suitable to you, a Jesus that seems suitable to you, um, right, fair, well, whatever you think about it, you want to find the Jesus that works for you. But that's never the question, right? What John wants you to do is to embrace the Jesus who is. Even if, unsurprisingly, it strikes, Jesus strikes you and bewilder, Jesus bewilders you sometimes. Because, see, our, our hearts are darkened by sin. So why would we be surprised that when we encounter Christ, we're a little bit bewildered? Our hearts have to be reshaped. Paul writes, our, our minds have to be transformed, right? We have to be renewed so that we, we can more readily, be, readily grasp who, who this man really, who this man really is. So, he says, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus' response is what? How can this be? The whole conversation, that, that is not just referring, I don't think, to the immediately preceding verses. It's just, just like the whole package for Nicodemus is, well, how can this be? I hear, you know, I hear what I hear what you're saying, but I don't understand a bit of it. I don't understand a bit of it, Nicodemus. How can this be? What are you saying? I mean, Nicodemus has spent his whole life on this, and it's like Jesus is speaking gibberish to him. And so in verse 10, Jesus says very directly, you are Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things? So what meaning are we to take from that? That he, sh Nicodemus, should understand. Um, parable of Lazarus just flashed into my head. Okay, so in the parable of Lazarus, there, which is about not neglecting the poor, is what it's really about, there's just one other point made in the parable of Lazarus, the parable where there's a rich man who goes in and out of a house every day and ignores Lazarus, who is poor, broken, dogs are licking his um, wounds. And when they die, their roles are reversed. And Lazarus is resting in the arms of Abraham. So in the context, the overarching point of the parable is don't neglect the Lazaruses of this world. But a second point emerges in the parable because a, the rich man says, well, let me go back and tell my brothers about all of this. And what is the reply in the parable? Ah, they have Moses. They have the scriptures. They already know. There's nothing to go back and tell them. People wonder, people so consumed sometimes, corners of Christianity, looking for a modern day prophet, you know. He's gonna bring he's gonna tell us something that we really, 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 really must know. And I could go through and name some of the ones, a lot of them are on television these days, who see themselves in having this big, huge gift of prophecy from God and stuff. And I'm telling you, that is I don't think that's a biblical perspective at all. We have it. We have it all. It's it's right here. It's right here. The the answers to the questions to the some of the bigger questions we have 
they're there. We don't have to go looking for something new. And so Jesus just looks at Nicodemus and says, well, you don't understand. And of course he doesn't understand. I mean, the whole story from Mount Sinai with Moses and the people and the giving of the law to Jesus, the whole story is a tragic story because the people don't get it. If they do get it, they don't live it. They don't understand. They're constantly going astray, and it's as true in Jesus' day as it was 500 years before, 1,000 years before, 1,500 years before. They don't get it. Well, it's 2,000 years later, and a lot of people don't get it. And it is. We have 2,000 years worth of scholars and wonderful Bible instructors and everything explaining this to people, but they still because for don't each get person, it. each person has to make that journey from the darkness into the light and come to a deeper understanding of what Jesus expects of us, of of how we are to live, of who He is, that He exists independent of my agreement, my what I like or don't like about Jesus, Jesus simply is. God simply is. Um, I've been reading a, a book by a Unitarian minister, John Pavlovitz, who, and it's he's Unitarian, which means it's it's kind of a find your own faith kind of thing, and it the book very much has a flavor of you know finding your faith. Find get out, get out of the box and find the God that makes sense to you and speaks to your heart and stuff. And I'm reading it. I, I'm trying to be open because I do follow him on Twitter, I guess. But all the time I'm screaming out mentally, at least. No, no, this is not it. I'm. We're not here to find a God who seems suitable to us. We're here to come to know the God who is, because he exists independently of what I think of him. He exists independently of whether I search for him or not. He exists independently of whatever I would do with my life. We're here to, to know, to come to know the God who is. And we have this library of writings to help us in that, but boy, Lord we all said to preach it, brother. <laughs> it's how it is. It's just how it is. And you know, I've been asked before. Well, why why don't we learn for some of this from generation to generation? Well, there is some cumulative effect that you can see on display in the church. Okay, as much of the world has become more Christian-like and has adopted a lot of Christian ethics. But really, when it comes down to it, each person has to make this journey themselves. They do. And they can have parents who help. Parents have play a big role as, as teachers and, and guardians and, and in help. But in, in the end, it comes down to each person having to make this journey. And we live in a world which wants to yank people off track so quickly so easily because after all I'm, I'm going to stop preaching it in a minute there Lauren but it, it's so attractive to think that the key is for me to follow my heart I'm just going to follow my heart and scripture says no <laughs> your heart's your heart's going to betray you it's going to lead you astray no don't follow your heart Retransform your heart, remake your heart, reorient your heart so that you are walking toward the God who is. Not a God that your darkened heart thinks you need. So anyway, enough preaching about all that, but I could go on. Um, and there's a question <clears throat> uh -huh. Excuse me, from Susan Morgan. She said, Rich asks, if modern Jews read the bulk of the Old Testament as tragic... Probably not, Rich. Good question. Do they read the Old Testament as tragic? You know, 
I don't really know. But, and I kind of don't see how one could fail to grasp that. In that, here we are, how long? 3,500 years, give or take a century or two, from the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And how's it going? Whether you're Christian or Jew, how's it going? If you're Jewish, you're still waiting for God's Messiah. How's it going at, at, at the keeping of, of God's law and teachings? I don't know. I think you would need to be fairly blind not to grasp that it hasn't gone well. You'd be fairly blind to grasp that the kings of Israel and the leaders of Israel led the people astray time after time after time after time. That's Ezekiel 34. Woe, you shepherds of Israel. Woe, you shepherds of Israel. You've led my sheep astray, God says. So I will become the shepherd, God says. Right? So, yeah, good, interesting question. Um... <laughs> I just saw Lauren's comment. A coffee mug that says preaching it 24-7, baby. That'd be okay with me. I can't help it. Sometimes it just I get worked up about these things. Could it be, I'm being devil's advocate here yeah. for a second. Could it be, though, I'm, I'm thinking of your very famous chart, already and not yet. Yes. Maybe because the Jews are viewing the world not through the eyes of Jesus, a risen Jesus, uh, the Son of God, God himself. And they look around them and they still see all this tragedy and sickness and people dying and COVID and everything else that's going on. And that's why they don't believe that he ever came or that he is the Son of God, <coughs> the Son of Man. And that's why they are still holding out hope that someday this person who they believe has not come yet is going to come and it, he is going to fulfill all these promises. Of Spot God. on, Miss Patty. And, you know, they're just waiting for it. They, they don't see anything in the middle where, you know, like as you talk about that you could move into this other dimension sometime that's heaven, where we see heaven for a glimpse. They mustn't see that. They must just see that as okay, because just the way the world is, sometimes there's going to be good things, sometimes there's going to be bad things. But they do, they can't, they, yeah, their eyes need to be opened, but they can't see. Because if you don't believe Jesus is. was resurrected, then the rest of the stuff we're talking about here goes out the window, right. because that's the key. That's the hint. That's, that's, that's the, what do they call them? Hint, uh, Linchpin? Yes. That's the linchpin. Um, everything in Christianity stands or falls on the truthfulness of the claim that Jesus was resurrected. Um, if he wasn't resurrected, all of us here today are wasting our time. We could find a better use for it. But he was, you see. That's the thing. He was. He was. And I get frustrated with people who are well educated and 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 won't put the work to really to really consider that claim of resurrection of the truthfulness of that claim so they just dismiss it out of hand without with, with no real reason to other than gosh that seems weird or something but anyway okay this is where Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus after Nicodemus says, ah, how can this be? I picture him throwing up his hands. Maybe he's saying, oy vey, how can this be? Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know. This is the we is Jesus. We speak of what we know. We testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. Now, this having seen ties into something that we're going to hear in a moment, that, of course, Jesus is from heaven. He's not, in that way, 
he's not just like the rest of us. Um, in this day, in this time in the first century, um, there were a lot of stories told among the Jews about earlier saints and prophets and people who had gone up to heaven and saw all kinds of things. Okay, um, And Jesus is going to say in a minute, you know, Basically, I'm from heaven. I'm actually here. Nobody else has come back to tell you any of this stuff. But but I have come to tell you these things, to show you these things at the end of verse 11. But still, you people, these are his fellow Jews, the Pharisees in particular, more particular Nicodemus and his buddies do not accept our testimony. And we could talk a long time about why Jesus ends up being rejected. And I don't think it's theological reasons at all. I think he is largely rejected because he threatens the people who are riding on the top of the world. People are riding on the top of the world like the Pharisees, like the priests, like the Sadducees. They don't want the world turned upside down. They don't want the Romans kicked out in the necessarily, and the <laughs> the temple cleansed. No, they're they're kind of okay with things as they are. Truth be told. So Jesus says, "We we we." I, let me just change it to I for just a minute. I speak of what I know, I testify to what I've seen, but still you people do not accept my testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you don't believe. You there, And underneath that word belief, I'll, I'm, I'm going to say this a thousand times a month until the day I'm put in the ground. Underneath that word believe is the Greek word for faith. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not faith. You do not trust me, is what he's saying. You do not trust that what I'm telling you is true. How then will you believe? How then will you faith? How will you have faith if I speak of heavenly things? Right? So... It, he, it's all in the Gospels, Jesus is challenging people to move beyond what they can see with their own eyes and he, hear with their own ears because Jesus is speaking to them at, of something greater, something higher. Yeah, we could spend all our time talking about these earthly things, but Jesus wants to talk about the things, the heavenly things, which I would phrase if as the thing he, he wants to talk to him about the things of God what God is doing who God is who Jesus is not just get all caught up in 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 the earthly stuff where we that's where we want to go all the time it's like okay I'll, another story I haven't used it in a while there's a great um, woman theologian her name is Fleming Rutledge glorious writer even if you don't agree with her all the time, glorious writer. But but she tells the story of a couple people being on a a a talk show debating Jesus's resurrection, and the one who is on the side of denying the resurrection says, "Okay, my daughter has two PhDs. She's a scientist and this, that, and this, and that. How could you expect her to believe in the resurrection of Jesus? And the other person says simply, well, I don't know your daughter. How big is her imagination? Which I just love. How, how, how large can you think? How large can you contemplate? You know, when you get into the nature of reality, you read any of the writings of Richard Feynman, the physicist, you realize that this world is, this creation is strange. There are things that they don't lend themselves to the little ticky-tack stuff in which we live most of our lives, these earthly things of cars and 
food and planes and TVs and all the rest of it. There, you, you have to get yourself into these heavenly things, into the things of God. If you're going to grasp what Jesus is talking about, it's all, it's all he says. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. Well, how then are you going to believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man himself. Now, the way, the, the way to read this is really not, I'll just point this out. The verse is easily misread because the better translation would be no one has ever gone into heaven. But there is the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Because what, what he's saying, he isn't saying he's already been to heaven, because that, that lies in the future, right, when he returned. I mean, he hasn't ascended to heaven. That exaltation is still in the future, um, his ascension. But as I said a few minutes ago, there were a lot of popular stories among the Jews of this time about people who went to heaven and then got shown all kinds of cool, cool things. What he's saying is, I came from heaven. And who, well, he's saying, who came from heaven to bring the testimony about this, to speak of these heavenly things? Well, it is the Son of Man. And you and I already know, because we learned it at ch the end of chapter one, who is the Son of Man, on whom the angels are ascending and descending, right? Remember the conversation? with Nathaniel, the Son of Man is Jesus. He is the Son of Man figure from Daniel 7, who has come before the throne of God to be given dominion and power over God's creation. He is the Son of Man. Judy's asking me, do I think it was an angry discussion? It reads like it was. I don't, I mean, I, 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 I don't mean to convey that. But I think Jesus is, Nicodemus is confused, and Jesus is what? Disappointed. Would he prefer that Nicodemus understood? Of course he would. You know, we'll get in a few, in a few minutes, we'll get into why this is happening. Why did Jesus become incarnate? What's the, what's the point of all of this? So would he prefer that that Nicodemus understands? Well, of course, yeah. So I don't, I don't think. But it had to be pretty crushing for Nicodemus when Jesus says something like, "You're Israel's teacher, and yet you do not understand these things." How can you know? I don't know. Maybe you know. I think Jesus is being really hard on them. I always have. <laughs> you know, I know that as we've talked about in the beginning, that John does not necessarily write this gospel in a chronological order. But what we've seen so far in the beginning is being told who Jesus was, who John the Baptist was. He's done one miracle, and he's turned over the tables. How much time has Nicodemus been around Jesus to hear what he is preaching to hear what others are saying about him. Um, his own disciples don't know who he is. Why is he so angry at this one Pharisee who at least wants to know? He wants to know more. He's come to him because he wants to understand. He, he likes what he hears, but he doesn't understand it all. And he is asking Jesus to explain this to him. I think Jesus kind of does get a little snippy with them right off the bat. You know, we don't snippy. know. Yeah. Snippy. Maybe so... this has been going on for a long time. Maybe Jesus maybe Jesus has seen him in the crowd so many times and is like, there's that guy again. How could he still not know who I am? But it is told very, very early in this gospel. And of course, we don't really know exactly how much time is passing. And we, right, were, that's what I and said. we were told in chapter 2, verse 23, that there were other signs there were other that signs. Jesus was right. doing. And maybe he witnessed some of these. But yes, and Jesus had done some self revelation, but maybe some of it is, some of it's wrapped up 
in who Nicodemus is. That if there was any person <laughs> anywhere in Ju Jerusalem, Judea, or Galilee who should get this, it should be Nicodemus. Are you saying because he's a teacher and a Pharisee? A teacher and a Pharisee, ruler, um, part of the ruling council. It's just sort of like, Nicodemus, you, even you don't get this. But what I'm saying is, the, okay, the rest of them don't get it at all. He at least is very interested in he's what curious. he's hearing. He he's wants curious. to know. He wants to know. He wants Jesus to explain it to him. Um, I mean, how many Pharisees do we end up knowing that become Jesus followers? And regardless of what happens in the conversation, does he is he is the result that he chases Nicodemus away from him? No, no. because Nicodemus defends Jesus yes. before his fellow Pharisees later in the gospel, and Nicodemus comes to help to bury Jesus with, with Joseph. after the yes with Joseph of Arimathea. So, however, we see this happening that evening. Um, Nicodemus doesn't sort of leave angry washing his hands of Jesus. That, that, I don't think we should see it that way. But Jesus is driving it home. Um, so look at, look at verse 14. So in verse 14, Jesus, verse 13 is all about Jesus coming from heaven. He's the son of man. He's bringing this testimony of heavenly things. And so he says, verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. Now, in the interest of time, we won't run that down. It's in, come from the book of Numbers. It's a story where, what? Ha it's just one of these sad stories. The people are murmuring against God and all this kind of stuff. And so God sends poisonous snakes and the people start dying from these poisonous snakes and they plead to God. And so the, God tells Moses to fashion a serpent on and, and at the end of a staff and raise it up. And when people see this, then they're, they're cured. So the staff and the poisonous, the carving of the poisonous snake at the top is about the giving of life then. And it is about the life coming from God because the people otherwise haven't done anything. It's just looking at this, at this, at this serpent. So, so that's the first piece about, so the giving of life is something, life is something that comes from God. That's the first thing that comes to mind in the story of the snake in the wilderness and why Jesus would use it now, and that'll become clear. And then he says, but as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Okay, so here is the staff of Moses with the snake at the top. People see it, right? And they are cured. They are saved. So Jesus is saying the Son of Man will be lifted up. Nicodemus does it. No. <coughs> what Jesus is talking about, but you and I do, that the Son of Man must be lifted up on a Roman cross. And those who see and believe, have put, put their faith in Jesus' own faithfulness all the way to death on that cross, well, they're rescued. You see, that, that's what Jesus is doing here. That just as the snake was the means of rescue back there in the wilderness from these poisonous snakes, so Jesus will be lifted up. He will be lifted up himself. The Son of Man will be lifted up on this Roman cross. Verse 13, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him, which is a lot more than a cure for a poisonous snake. So that everyone who believes, everyone who faiths, everyone who puts their faith in Jesus may have eternal life in him, in whom the Son of Man, and who is the Son of Man, it's Jesus. 
And you might wish he said something like that, everyone who believes may have eternal life in me, but he doesn't. He refers to himself as the son of man, and he talks about these things in the third person a lot. I don't know why. Verse 15, that everyone who believes, everyone who faith may have eternal life in him, in the son of man, in Jesus. Verse 16, what's the larger thing happening here? And here we come to this famous, famous verse. And we're going to read verse 16 and 17 together. For God so loved the world. Part of the world? Some of the world? The pretty parts? The not so pretty parts? The, the, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life so that whoever faiths in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the big story. The big story is that God is rescuing humanity, rescuing us from ourselves in Jesus. Why? Why didn't God just do something else, start somewhere else on some other planet or something? Why does God persevere? through all, all the rejection of God that's heaped upon God by his people. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Some in all translations would be his only begotten son, which is clearly Jesus. That whoever believes in him, whoever puts their faith in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's a really, you know, verse 16 gets all the press. You remember at the football games, that guy with the big wig who would have the little sign that would go John 3, 16 and everything on it. Just too many Christians forget verse 17. Too many Christians are They don't understand that it, God's purpose is not to condemn the world. God's purpose is not to condemn anybody. God's purpose is to reconcile humanity. God's grace is expansive, 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 big, 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 big. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life because God did not send his son into the world to condemn it but to save the world through him. So whenever you're offered a choice between God's condemning the world and God's saving the world, well, choose the saving part. This is John Wesley's great insight, I think, is that the way to understand who God is is to begin with a simple statement from 1 John, used five times in 1 John, that God is love. That's the underlying truth about the Trinity. That the triune God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit locked in the unity of, of in the common unity, the community, the common unity from all time, for all time, beyond all time. The Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father and onward, and so it's no surprise then that God so loved the world that he created, that his desire is to reconcile everybody to God. Can he drag them kicking and screaming into that? No, because that's not love. Can he bribe them? That's not love. Can he threaten them? No, that's not love, but God's purpose, God's purpose is to save the world. So my, you know, I, I've been reading the Bible a fair bit for the past couple decades in this work, and, and I just keep coming back to an ever more expansive understanding of God's grace 
But I don't think in, in the end everyone is saved. I think that that's not that's not the reading of Scripture. And why is it not? Because there will be people who will shake their fist at God all the way to the end. There just will be. I think I might have known some. I don't know. Because human pride is, is very powerful. And as C.S. Lewis puts it, you know, in the great divorce, Arthur's favorite book, you know, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. It's, it's, um, God doesn't have to condemn people to hell. They condemn themselves to it in this world and the next. So, okay. So let's just read verse 16 and 17 and we'll go on into 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Right? That's, that's the measure of that's what salvation is. Whoever trusts Jesus in this is not condemned. But whoever doesn't stands condemned already. See? It's something they've done to themselves. They, they're condemned already. Why? Because they haven't believed in the name of God's one and only Son, which is believed in, you know, that, that's kind of an ancient world thing and the power of the name. But they haven't believed and put their faith in God's one and only Son. They stand already condemned. And so, and so, yeah, you have to walk out of the darkness into the light. Um, and we could spend, we're not going to do it today or, or even this next week talking about different ways of speaking of this. But I just think that, that John is drawing our attention to a couple of things. The expansiveness of God's love and grace and the fact that that is all focused upon Jesus. It's all focused upon the Son, God's only begotten Son. It's not a what, it's a who that's the point. The who that's the point. And so John writes in verse 19, we'll finish up, we'll just kind of read through this, finish up, come back to this a little bit next week. This is the verdict, John, Jesus says. This is the verdict John writes, because he isn't quoting Jesus anymore. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Their hearts are malformed. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So John does a fabulous job here, again, of using this theme of light and darkness. And we come back together next week, we will talk about this, um, about the importance of that theme and the truth of it. And um, it's a, for me, it's a very thrilling gospel. John writes very differently, doesn't he? than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But, um, well, we, we will we'll hear them. So, Patty, do you want to come around and close us in prayer? Yeah. For today? Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. There we both are. There we both are. Okay. Good lesson today. It's all John's mm -hmm. gospel. It's not me. I think I talk too much today. No, you never talk too much. You can meet. I do. Too. You always have good stuff. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for being here with us today. We hope to see you on Sunday. As yeah. As we finish the, as we sort of, we're just starting in that nine month series. Yes. As we kind of move along there and um, that will all be good. It'll all be great. Okay, yes. So we thank you for being here with us today. Let's close in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this way to get together. We're so grateful, God, to still have this class together all this time. And we are really, Lord, looking forward to the day that this Tuesday class is going to be live in person down in Pierrot Hall. But 
for the time being, we're good. And we just know, Lord, that this group, we all have lots of joys and concerns on our heart. We heard earlier about the joy of Dale Cotton getting to go home, and we are going to pray and continue to pray for Rita Gray's daughter, Andrea. And we know that there are lots of other prayers on people's hearts today, God. And we do ask your Holy Spirit to just lift all of those joys and concerns up to you now. We love you, Lord. We are grateful, Lord. We lift up just that gratitude to you today. All this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Bye, friends. Bye. And I was told last week that pieces of the equipment needed in Pearl Hall, they are, they are arriving now. Oh. So things are happening. Oh. As soon as it's done... But we will still be doing this live also from That's what Pearl we're waiting Hall. for. We're so, waiting to be able yes. to live stream from Pearl. Yes. Otherwise, we could just right. go back in there. But we want to be able to be live yes. together, those who can, but those who can't be there, to be right. able to live stream it and record it and put it up on right. video and then put up the podcast and all that stuff. I quite understand why it's taken this long since I don't pretty understand. much Scott bought a camera for 20 <laughs> bucks at Best Buy and we've been doing this since a year ago, March. But anyway, <laughs> bye everybody. Bye. Love y'all. Adios.